Studies show that hair loss drugs, they really only work for as long as we take them. And if we quit, we'll lose any hair that we'd preserved, often in just a matter of months. But what if we could keep our hair gains even after quitting? Results from a new study suggest this might be possible, but don't get too excited, not yet. Here's everything we need to know. Hi, this is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in today's video, we're gonna be diving into what some may call the holy grail of hair loss, lasting hair regrowth, even after quitting all treatments. Now, results from this 2020 study imply that with certain treatments, this might actually be possible. But before we can get into the details, I don't want anyone quitting their routines, and I certainly don't want anybody overreacting to what I would consider very preliminary data, mainly because I don't want anyone worsening their hair loss outcomes. What I do wanna talk about is this study, because the findings are intriguing, and if they're replicated in larger clinical trials, they might redefine some of the ways that we treat pattern hair loss. But again, please watch the whole video, because as a medical editor, I can't tell you how many times I've seen one preliminary study generate tons of hope in the hair loss world, only for follow-up studies to refute those initial findings. I'll even give an example of this happening and backfiring later in this video. Also, if you're fighting hair loss and you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the information online, or maybe you just want some personal help, head to the description of this video and click the link below to sign up for our free 10-day email course on achieving hair regrowth. We'll reveal how marketers manipulate studies to sell us supplements we really don't need, how to think about analyzing hair loss studies, which natural interventions show some potential, even if they rank lower on the hierarchy of evidence, success stories using both natural and conventional strategies, and a whole lot more. So let's dive into this study. It was published in 2020 and it tested the use of topical minoxidil and microneedling in men with androgenic alopecia. Now, as a quick refresher, topical minoxidil is a medication used for hair growth. Microneedling is a therapy that uses medical grade needles to repeatedly wound the outer layers of our skin. Think of these tools sort of like small medieval torture devices. In androgenic alopecia, well, in adults, that's one of the most common hair loss disorders. It's caused by a combination of genes and male hormones, and it seems to accelerate under certain scalp environments, which we've covered in our hair loss equation video. So this study took 71 men with androgenic alopecia and randomly sorted them into three groups. First, a minoxidil group, where the men applied 5% minoxidil twice daily. Second, a microneedling group, where the men did a microneedling session once every three weeks. And third, a minoxidil plus microneedling group, where the men did both of these things concurrently. After six months, what were the results? First, all three groups showed statistically significant increases in terminal hair counts. Minoxidil and microneedling performed similarly well, but minoxidil plus microneedling was the clear winner, with better hair count increases versus both minoxidil alone and microneedling alone. Okay, cool. I mean, we've known since Rashida Durat's landmark study in 2013 that microneedling may enhance the effectiveness of topical minoxidil. And while results replication is important, it's actually what these researchers did next that made this study in 2020 particularly interesting to me. After the six month hair evaluations, the researchers stopped all treatments for the men. Then, six months after quitting all treatments, the researchers brought back in the participants to answer the following question. How much hair growth did everybody retain, even in the absence of treatment? So before we go further, let's review what we already know about quitting treatments. Studies show that three to six months after quitting minoxidil, all new hair growth is lost, and a person will resume losing hair at the same rate as before, just like a placebo group. In other words, within six months of quitting minoxidil, your hair should look like it would have had you never used the drug at all. So what happened in this study when the men came back six months later for a hair evaluation? In the minoxidil group, 90% of men lost all the new hair they'd regrown and their progression of hair loss continued. Only 10% of men retained some of that new hair growth. Again, this aligns with past findings, no surprises here. But what about the men who did microneedling or minoxidil plus microneedling? Well, interestingly, in these groups, the results were actually flipped. Here, only 10% of the men lost their new hair and saw hair loss continue. But fascinatingly, 70% of these men retained at least some new hair regrowth 
20% actually retained all of their new growth. On a personal note, I found this to be really interesting. I mean, how is it that as a standalone treatment, quitting minoxidil will cause all of our new hair regrowth to fall out? But then when we combine minoxidil with microneedling, the results seem to have more staying power. They stick around longer even after quitting both therapies for six months. The researchers in this study didn't speculate, but to me, there are potentially at least two possibilities. Possibility number one, these results, they might not reflect reality and for at least a couple reasons. First, it's possible that if we extended the duration of this washout period, all hair gains for all groups would go away entirely. On that note, maybe six months just isn't long enough to see a full loss of results from microneedling. For instance, data on a different drug, finasteride, show that after quitting that drug, all hair is typically lost over a longer time period typically three to 12 months. And according to this chart, it sometimes takes even longer. So maybe six months alone isn't long enough to wash out the results to truly evaluate this question. The second explanation, which might be just as plausible, is that the number of participants in each treatment group here is relatively small. We're talking about 20 men. So it's possible that if we expanded this trial to 500 people, the results might change. In fact, I see this happen all the time in hair loss research. For instance, way back in 2014, I remember a lot of people getting really excited about an initial study from Dr. George Cozzarellis' team about prostaglandin D2 and its potential causal role in androgenic alopecia. Within a few weeks of its publication, companies started to evaluate the possibility of repurposing for hair loss drugs prostaglandin D2 receptor antagonists. This led to a ton of excitement over drugs already developed to treat asthma, like cetipepirint, which led to Allergen launching a clinical trial on cetipepirint for men with androgenic alopecia. Forums were ablaze with excitement. People were doing group buys for prostaglandin D2 receptor antagonists, applying them on their scalp. Some people were taking them orally. A couple people were reporting success. I mean, things went crazy for about a year. And then what happened? Well. The beta testers on forums started to disappear, excitement started to dwindle, then it turned to confusion, then anger after a long wait for the results of the allergen trial. And all the while, new studies started to crop up showing that that relationship between prostaglandins and hair loss, it's actually far more complicated than initially expected and perhaps contradictory in some cases to Dr. Cozzarellis' first findings. Again, this is how science starts. Then, Allergen quietly published the results of that SETI study, showing no benefit from this drug for hair loss. And that led to some significant disappointment and a little bit of outrage amongst hair loss sufferers because of all the excitement initially. So let's not do that same exercise with this study. Again, this is all preliminary data and I don't want anybody permanently withdrawing from treatments because of one subgroup analysis on just 20 men. But for a moment, let's explore a different possibility. Possibility number two. Let's say that these results, they do reflect reality and that the hair regrowth from microneedling or even microneedling plus minoxidil, let's say that it sticks around for a long time even after quitting both therapies. In this situation, what might give the treatment its staying power? Again, this is all speculation, but if you ask me, I think that these results might have something to do with how microneedling works. In other words, microneedling's mechanisms of action. So there are many ways to treat hair loss and we can sort of categorize these treatments by how they work. We've got things like minoxidil and finasteride, and in my eyes, I've always seen these sort of as biological light switches. You start taking them, and then they have a specific effect on your scalp tissue. For minoxidil, that's vasodilation, prostaglandin modulation, some influence over the WNT beta catenin pathway, maybe changes to potassium ion channels. For finasteride, that's type 2 5 alpha reductase inhibition, which helps to lower DHT levels. When you start using these drugs, it's almost like switching on a light. You use it, the biological effects start taking hold and studies show that hair counts increase, hair thickness can improve, all the things that we're looking for. But these biological effects, well, they really only last as long as that light switch is on, as long as we're taking these drugs, which is why when we stop taking the drugs, that light switch gets turned off and over the next several months, we begin to lose our hair gains and then our hair loss continues. Now, that is one category of treatment. Another category is what I might refer to as stimulation-based therapies. These are interventions like microneedling, PDO monofilament threading, maybe even massaging. And these things, they're speculated to promote hair growth through a different means, like tissue manipulation. For example, acute wound healing. Now, technically, wounding is also a biological light switch because 
Following a micro injury, we see short term increases to proteins and growth factors that might help kickstart a new growth stage of our hair cycle. We also see an increase in an enzyme called sulfotransferase, which is absolutely critical to activating for the drug minoxidil. And that's one of the reasons why microneedling is suspected to enhance the effects of minoxidil. And yes, these effects, they are temporary. They're biological light switches. They only last for as long as we repeat the wounding exercises. But that is not the whole story. Because when we repeat acute wounding over a long enough time scale, we also see other effects, specifically tissue remodeling. We see improvements to scarring, and we even see improvements to angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessel channels. We know this because several studies have demonstrated in humans that repeated microneedling diminishes the appearance of acne scars, and in animal models, it encourages angiogenesis in repeatedly wounded tissues. This is important because if we look at all of the features of a balding scalp, increased levels of DHT, that's really just one part of the equation. We also see dysregulations to prostaglandins, lower blood and oxygen levels, increased scar tissue surrounding the hair follicles. I even wrote a paper in 2017 arguing that this scar tissue, also called parafollicular fibrosis, might act as a rate limiting regrowth factor for drugs like finasteride. So it goes without saying that targeting these features in addition to DHT reduction might also enhance hair regrowth. Now, these studies also show the tissue remodeling, it takes a long time to revert. In other words, once we stop a treatment that helps remodel our tissue, the effects of that tissue remodeling are likely to remain, at least for a little while. So connecting the dots here, Maybe repeated microneedling, in addition to its short-term effects, helps to regrow hair, perhaps through encouraging angiogenesis and maybe attenuating or reducing fibrosis in our scalp skin. And maybe once we stop microneedling, these two effects remain. After all, that's what we see in studies on acne patients. After they stop microneedling, their acne scars, well, they remain diminished. And it's not unreasonable to assume that a similar effect might also be happening in our scalps. So to wrap this up, maybe the staying power of hair loss treatments Maybe they're determined in part by how they work. Biological light switches only work for as long as we use them. But tissue remodeling interventions, those might work for longer, even after quitting, because it can take a long time for tissue remodeling to revert. Again, this is all just a hypothesis, but it's one that I've been thinking about recently, especially as my team and I just finished our latest project, a massive literature review on the use of microneedling for hair loss disorders. We looked in depth at nearly 30 studies and we saw relatively consistent results, hair count improvements for those incorporating these little torture devices into their routine. We also just got word that that microneedling review was accepted for publication, so expect a big video on that soon. So that's it. If you enjoyed this video, stick around for next week. And again, if you're fighting hair loss and you're feeling overwhelmed or if you want help, sign up for our free email course. It's designed to help you avoid all the noise online and just start putting yourself in a position for success. Thanks for watching, take care.